that is very packed. So if we do not start in time, I'm afraid we will not be able to finish in time. So um, you've heard this morning about, I wait at least for the people in the room to sit down. Could we? Gentlemen? OK. Um, we will, uh, you, uh, you also have heard in the, in the morning the call. So we went through the topics, through the technical issues of the topics. And we will move in the second part of this morning. We will move into rules uh, for participation, some advices, for lesson learning from the past. Uh, but also more on the other aspects of the call, not only the technical issues, but the communication, dissemination, exploitation of results, some intellectual property rights issues, and we will also hear from our members, Hydrogen Europe, Hydrogen Europe Research, and national contact points in the member states, in the EU member states. So with that, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Lionel. He's the call coordinator, and he will guide you through the rules for participation. Thank you, Mirella. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, everything is fine for you. I read yesterday a quote that was saying, if you follow all the rules, you miss all the fun. It, it could be true for uh, many things in life, but it certainly does not apply for the call 2018 of the FCH. Um, I'll speak about the rules for participation, call conditions, evaluation, and submission of proposals. The FCH 2018 call is governed by two sets of rules. The first one, that are the general annexes of H 2020. These are applied without derogation. They are applied mutatis mutandis. And we um, take them on board for the FCH 2018 call. I will explain the most relevant of them to you in a few minutes. You have another set of rules that are coming from the annual work plan, the OPE, that this year introduced an additional eligibility criteria regarding the budget that you could ask for innovation actions. So let's start for the tour. Annex A, list of countries and rules for funding. Age 2020 is open to the world. That means entities that are established in any place of the globe can participate in an Age 2020 project. Regarding funding, that's different. The funding is automatically provided to entities that are established in the member states, and UK is still a member state. It's automatically given to entities established in the associated countries of H2020, uh, like uh, Switzerland, uh, Norway, um, Israel, Turkey, are associated countries, and you could find the list of them in the participant portal. And the funding is given to a list of uh, least developed countries. It starts from uh, Afghanistan up until Zimbabwe. You, for all the other types of organization established in other countries, funding could be given if uh, certain conditions are met. First one is if it is explicitly mentioned in the OP. So far in the current OP, this is not valid. Or if there is a bilateral agreement on science and technology between this country and H2020. So far, I'm not aware of any. Or the third possibility is that if you, as applicant, demonstrate that this entity coming from uh, outside uh, countries is critical for your proposal, critical for your project. So let's take an example. You would like to include a Japanese institute in your proposal. You can. H2020 is open to the world. But if you would like them to be financed, to be financially supported, uh, you will need to build your case. Perhaps they have uh, critical staff that will bring advices to your proposal. Perhaps they have a critical piece of IP. They own a patent. Perhaps they have um, critical infrastructure, equipment, and this will be assessed by the experts during the evaluation. So clearly, uh, build your case. Outside this general openness of age 2020, um, there are three topics for which um, participation of uh, members' countries of IPHE, International Partnership for uh, Hydrogen and Fuel Cell in the Economy, is um, Encourage, strongly uh, encourage. So pay attention to that as well. Annex B now, Al admissibility and eligibility. A proposal is admissible when it is submitted on time 
in the IT system which is designed for that, called SEP. Mirella mentioned before, it seems obvious, but every year we receive an email from a very unfortunate applicant who could not submit the uh, proposal because not on time in the system. Your proposal must be readable, printable, and um, accessible. Um, the template of the proposal indicates some uh, instruction regarding the minimum font to be used in writing the proposal. The purpose of the evaluation is not to make our expert to be uh, uh, blinded uh, after spending hours looking for tiny fonts I in a proposal. There are as well instructions regarding the minimum margin to be used in the document and clear <coughs> instruction on the section, how to build uh, your document. All this is detailed in the template of proposals. Uh, um, an admissible proposal is complete. All uh, relevant information should be there, technically, administratively, and description of the operational capacity of the partners. And it, it should include a draft plan for exploitation and dissemination of the results. It's a five pages additional document. A proposal is eligible now when it um, is in line, wholly or in part, with a topic and where it is complying with the minimum requirement regarding participation. And there you have to differentiate according to the type of action. For uh, RIA and IEA, you need at least three um, legal entities established in uh, different member states, and all these three entities being independent from each other. So Enrique uh, de France, Enrique de Belgium, Enrique de Germany cannot do a RIA project together. CSA, the requirement is the following, at least one legal entity established I in a member state or an associated country. Colleagues have mentioned uh, <laughs> the types of actions. Here are the official definition. Quickly, RIA is about uh, basic and applied research. It's looked as well at small-scale uh, prototyping activities. IA, innovation actions, looked at um, demonstrating, piloting, uh, large-scale product or services, as well as um, close-to-market uh, replication. And CSA, coordination and support actions, are standing for accompanying measures. Standardization, um, networking, communication, dissemination, uh, policies, and so on. The funding to these three uh, types of activities is always 100%, except for innovation action, when you have um, a profit organization involved, where the funding is 70%. Technology readiness, uh, mentioned earlier, it span from TRL2 to TRL8 for all the action of the call 2018. Um, there is a degree of overlap between RIA, um, RIA type of actions and the IA types of uh, actions. A CSA, coordination and support action has obviously no TRL level, and pay attention when you read your topic within the scope, the TRL at the beginning is mentioned, the TRL at the end is mentioned. If your proposal is not in line with these two, TRL at the beginning, TRL at the end, your proposal is out of scope, so pay attention to it. For some topic, we have mentioned in addition MRL, so Manufacturing Readiness Level. There is a definition which is provided in the, uh, the OP, in the document, have a look at it. And when your topic requires some MRL, um, MRL target, please uh, address them. Now I move to evaluation rules regarding the selection criteria. They are of two types, financial and operational. Financial uh, capacity, it means that um, the financial regulation impose to preserve and secure the financial interest of the European taxpayer money. It means when uh, the FCH will do payments to entities, we must make sure that these entities are financially viable to handle uh, that money. So for coordinators of proposal, you need to complete a self-assessment on your financial uh, viability. It will return you a score. You will have to compute some indicators based on your uh, turnover, profitability, and so on, some other uh, um, large figure, if you want. And it will return you a score, or let's say an adjective. If the adjective is weak, my entity is weak, then you could not assume the coordinator role. 
So find somewhere in your consortium another partner that could shift and become the coordinator instead of uh, your organization. Now, if the result, the adjective is insufficient, you are not allowed to participate in the H2020 uh, project. Operational capacity now, it is um, assessed by the expert during the evaluation. It's a separate question that they have to answer if each of the participants has sufficient um, operational capacity, human but as well technical aspect, to undertake the action or the activities linked with that specific partners. How it is that um, assessed is based on five, five, sorry, five um, items, CVs of the staff who will do uh, the work, list of, uh, list of publication of product that the organization has done in line wi with the topic, list of up to five project or activities in line wi with the topic or your proposal, infrastructure and equipment that are relevant I in this uh, institute um, and relevant for the considered proposal, and any third party's contribution. If the evaluators are not convinced of the operational capacity, they will remove that partner, they will remove the budget, and they will remove the activities of that partner. And then they will score. So that means you will start with a big disadvantage if you have in your consortium an entity that do not meet with the uh, operational capacity. So play, uh, pay attention who you are teaming with. Continue on the score. All the proposals are evaluated according to three criteria. Excellence, impact, quality and efficiency of implementation. You have, in the Annex Age, the questions that the evaluator have to answer. So download this questionnaire and give them the, give them the answers to these uh, questions when you write your proposal. There are some uh, quality thresholds. So for each criterion, the proposal is scored on a scale starting from zero. So zero is very the bottom, it's uh, zero. And five, which is excellent. You must have at least three as a score for excellence, at least three for impact, and at least three for implementation. That gives nine, unfortunately, problem. There is an overall quality threshold of 10 points. So you need three, three, and a four, for example, to be considered for the next phase of the evaluation. Last general, general analysis of uh, age 2020, it's about uh, open access to research data. Because the partners will be uh, involved in data sharing uh, activities, uh, you must take measure and ensure that any third parties I in the world can have access to, um, can have access, can mine, can uh, disseminate, exploit the results coming from your project. This is called the underlying data, the one that you use to validate your pub scientific publication. This should be open. <laughs> and any other type of data that you would have defined in the consortium that could be uh, open to the world. You will mention what is your data management uh, strategy in a document called data management plan that includes which data the research will generate, how you will preserve, how you will cure that data, and uh, which type of data will be open or not. The cost linked to this data management plan are to be put in your proposal. These costs are eligible. The evaluators will look at this data aspect, if it's uh, open or not, but it will not impact their score. You will not be penalized if you decide to opt out. You will not be favored in case you are in this uh, open data, uh, open access to research data, sorry. Even later on, if at proposal stage you say, yes, I will open my research data, later on, before or after the signature of the current agreement, you can decide to opt out. However, this is only for limited cases. And you need to build um, certain justification in order to opt out of this uh, open access of research data. The motto there is to be as open as possible and uh, as close as necessary. <laughs> Next. Let's move to the second set of rules, and there are um, a lot less of them. It's the OPE 2018. That includes 
for five topics, for the five topics on innovation action, a maximum uh, of funding that could be required by the proposal. So it was said earlier this morning for the uh, boat, topic 1.1, it's 12 million euro as a maximum. If you request just one euro more or even a cent of a euro more, your proposal is not eligible. So stick to that uh, maximum amount or, or, or put lower. Now let's take a step back on and uh, look at the different steps in the uh, evaluation process. Ten days ago, the call was published. On the 24th of April, the call will be closed. And we must have the grant agreement, the future successful proposal, the project, must be signed before Christmas, on 24th of uh, December. Now I'm going to explain to you the first four steps, the, the one in green. Perhaps uh, you don't know where to find our call. Um, <coughs> it's very easy. Go in the participant portal click on Funding Opportunity, the tab Funding Opportunities, select H2020, and um, the FCH 2018 call is the first result in the list. In case it's not, put a filter, typing FCH, and it will come. From there, you will see a list of the topics, the 20 topics presented by the colleagues. If you click on one of them, this is what you will see. You have a topic description, you have the topic conditions and uh, other documents, namely they are the annexes I've just summarized for you um, some minutes ago. You could start the submission of uh, your proposal. It will open a new window uh, on your screen. It's, a, it's an online tool to start your proposal. You will be able to download the template of the proposal. And in case you need help, there are two buttons there available for, for help the how to section, and as well the online manual. Keep an eye on partner search. In the middle of the slide in yellow, you see there is an activity, an, um, a button, sorry, for partner search, and you have a number of three. I'll tell you in a moment why. If you click on topic description, then each topic will be listed in this way. You have first section is the specific challenge. It's the broad context of the topic. Then you go into the scope, you will find information regarding the TRL level there, the consortium composition, an indicative budget or a maximum budget, uh, expected duration, and so on. And the last section is about expected impact, how you will reach your KPIs, cost reduction, how you will contribute to environmental policy or industrial policies. Scope is what you have to be in line <coughs> to, otherwise the proposal is out of scope. And, uh, it it will uh, get a low score or not even evaluated. For the partner search, you remember the button I indicated earlier? If you click on it, the number three referred to entities that are looking for partners in this specific topic. So you could have full explanation on what they do, the description of the competencies of that partners, and you can contact them, you, you can contact the leader of that specific entities. If there are no entities looking for partner in the topic you are interested in, well, this afternoon will be an occasion to know uh, people to team with, or you could use the regular button uh, on the H 2020 participant portal, search partner. There you will have information on, um, on if you find uh, an entity to collaborate with, you will know if they have been collaborating with other consortium in the past, which other entities are cooperating the most. If there were partner or coordinators in project, you will see the distribution of project between FP7 and H2020. So you will have a lot more of information before you decide to initiate contact uh, with them. You need to register your organization in order to be able to submit a proposal. This is done very easily through the participant portal again in uh, in, um, there is a button there, register my organization. As a next step, you need to perform the self-assessment to check the uh, financial uh, viability. It's something that we recommend, especially in case if your entity is in a weak financial situation or insufficient financial situation. It will be done, in any case, during the grant proposal stage by the FCH for the coordinating entities only. Last action to do, because you have uh, found partners, you know where topics are, and uh, you have registered your organization, is to submit your proposal. Um, 
this window will open for you. There is a process over you, some kind of a metro line where you see at which stage you are and how many actions are still remaining from your side. An information panel telling you till how many days, perhaps even hours or minutes, if you come close to the uh, call closure moment, you have before submission of your proposal. And um, the section where you can download the um, Word documents, the annexes. Now, let's um, put us ourselves later in time. We are the 24th of April, the call is closed, we have amassed plenty of uh, good proposals, and we will prepare for uh, the grant agreement signature. And in the middle, there is one step in there, which is called the evaluation. Evaluation um, is done in a way that to reduce time between the call closure and the signature of a grant agreement. So quality of your proposal is absolutely key. We have eight months, in fact, from call closure <laughs> to signature of the grant agreement. Your proposal must be as close as possible to a final product. The expert will not recommend modification to your proposal. So they will be, on the contrary, instructed to grade it very low in case there are shortcomings in your proposal. I'll go into the detail of the evaluation. It will start shortly after the 24th of uh, April, and it will finish in July. It's divided in intermediate steps. The first one is when individual expert, we looked at your proposal in a remote fashion. Then we invite all the experts for the entire call to come in Brussels. The one who has been reading your proposal will sit in a meeting room to reach a consensus, and at the end, when all the consensus is for all the proposals uh, have been done, we do a panel review, a harmonization exercise among the entire call. At the end of that exercise, we have a ranked list of proposals according to their merits, according to the score they got, and uh, uh, excellence, impact, and uh, implementation. This list is then approved by the governing board of the SCH. Where do we select experts? Participant portal again, uh, and I encourage you to register. We need experts um, to read our proposal, to evaluate our proposals. Experts are selected according to their skills, to their experiences. It could be uh, technical experiences, but it could be as well uh, regarding uh, businesses. It could be on safety, on education. Uh, all these things are taken uh, into account. And when we picked up expert from this large database, we ensure that there is equilibrium, um, a large geographical coverage um, in Europe, that there is a gender balance, that there is a public and private representative, and that we ensure a rotation of experts from years to years, in order not to have the same expert uh, uh, in all the years of the evaluation. Each proposal is read by at least three experts, and in most cases it's uh, five for innovation action. And one of, uh, uh, one of the external participants is an observer. So that person is not involved in reading any proposal, but is looking at how well the process is conducted if we, as FCH, are following the rules indicated in H2020 or in the uh, OP, an old work plan. Obviously, if uh, an expert is in the case of a conflict of interest, he or she cannot participate in the proposal. And we verify that very carefully before um, assigning proposals to experts. My last slide. When will you hear about us after you submit your proposal? Shortly after the call closure, you will get basic statistics, how many proposals we have received per topic. Then, after the evaluation, after the approval by the governing board of the rank list, so that means July, August, something like this, you will, um, we will start the grant agreement preparation with a successful proposal, and we will tell to the others, perhaps you are in the reserve list, or perhaps, fortunately, you will have to try next time. This is uh, when you will get answers, uh, feedback from us, sorry. And from that moment, the moment you receive the letter, you could file a complaint. The result of the evaluation cannot be challenged. The, uh, it's the opinion of the uh, expert. 
but you could file a complaint regarding the uh, procedural uh, aspect of your proposal in case you want. And you have 30 days to do so from the moment you receive the evaluation summary result letter. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I'll give the floor to my colleague Dionysis. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Dionysis Timis. I can hear myself. I th think. Uh, okay, that's normal. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and I'll be talking to you today about some uh, do's and don'ts, as we call them here at FCH, which is basically just a, a wealth of knowledge that we've accumulated over the years of evaluations, of feedback we have received, uh, bad comments, failing proposals, and some hints to help you through this uh, intense process of uh, submitting your proposal, preparing it, etc. So the big question that we have is what do evaluators want? And I'm sure that you're all, you all have that question through your heads where you're building your proposals. Uh, I would like to get you to as close as possible to be able to read the minds of the evaluators. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. So I will at least show you what are the tools that they are using to evaluate you. So this brings me to my first tip, which is what you've heard many times today to focus on the topic. Make sure you understand the topic clearly. Make sure that you understand every wording and its significance. This is what you will be measured against. The evaluators will only have your topic and your proposal. One step, one step. Ah, sorry, I skipped one step. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll leave that there. Uh, so this is the only thing that the, the evaluators will have when they're assessing your proposal, the topic. You'll be judged against that. Uh, another useful thing is uh, what Lionel mentioned earlier, the evaluation criteria. I have put a link for you there that you can uh, find the evaluation criteria uh, and all the sub-criteria that you will be judged against. This is what the, ev the evaluators will use to assess and, and grade your proposals. So make sure that you keep those in mind while you're writing your proposal. Uh, and as well, I have uh, four main questions that it's important, I feel it's important that you have them uh, in the back of your heads uh, while you're uh, preparing your proposals. The first I already covered, make sure that you're in, in line completely with the topic description. The second is to think about the European dimension and how Europe will benefit from this proposal. Think about the aspects of markets, think about industries, think about the environment. The third it relates to innovation. Make sure that what you're proposing has not been done before. There is a wealth of data available. You can access it. Uh, we have a database called Cordis. You have our website where you can see past projects. Make sure you have gone through all this information when you're preparing your proposal to make sure that you're really proposing something innovative. Uh, and the last is, uh, can your proposal bring uh, European players together? Will it create synergies among the beneficiaries that, you, that your consortium will have? Will it actually contribute to the um, strengthening of the European value chain? These are important things that you should be considering. So this brings me to my next tip. And it's about how you will uh, start your uh, process. Uh, it's important as you start to build your, your proposal that you have a very clear idea of what you're doing. Make sure that you have a concrete uh, structure, a skeleton, let's say, of what is your objective, what do you plan to do? And with this, you can then approach uh, and find the suitable partners for, for your proposal. And, and this is my second point. Make sure that you have selected the best possible partners for your proposal. This might not be the partners that you've been uh, used to collaborating in the past. This might not be people that you know, and this is the reason what we ha why we have such events as these. Please take advantage of the brokerage event that we have in the afternoon and try to pitch your idea, if you already have one, to find suitable partners. And you have to remember that you will be judged against your weakest partner. The weakest partner will be your weakest link, and you will be penalized if the, if the partner is not suitable for the topic. Uh, and in the, at the end, also make sure that you address the impacts that we have in our, uh, in our topic description. Make sure that you can actually deliver what we expect and what is written in the topic description. Uh, as it was mentioned earlier, I'm, not, I'm going to repeat it once more because it's very important. Be clear on your TRLs. Make sure that you are aware of where you start and where you, 
where you can go the end of your TRL and make sure that you clearly state how you will achieve this transition from one TRL to the other. So this brings us to some examples of, uh, that we have seen for the first criterion that you will be assessed again against. Uh, these are some examples of, uh, let's say, failing comments that we have seen from evaluators. Okay, the, these, uh, these will all be available uh, online, these presentations, and uh, I apologize for the uh, great amount of text that you have there. I'm not going to read through them all, but uh, maybe just going through a few. Uh, the objectives are general and not quantifiable, and you will see that uh, the, the the topic of the the issue of the objectives is uh, a very frequent uh, remark that uh, the evaluators make. Make sure that your objectives are smart. They are specific. They are measurable. They are uh, attainable. They are relevant, and they are timed. We have. Uh, this might seem obvious to you, but we are seeing again and again objectives which do not fall under this criteria. Uh, the other uh, aspect that uh, we see a lot is that you don't uh, explain your methodology. This is uh, the excellence assesses your, your science, basically, your proposed methodology. Please make sure that you explained, explain your steps carefully, concisely, and precisely. The evaluators will not have no other means except your proposal and the topic to assess what, what you propose. Please make sure that all the information is in there in your proposal and make sure that it is easy to find. Another is, uh, issue which is often uh, considered as a uh, failing, let's say, aspect is the issue of the standard, the, the state of art, of the art. <coughs> in many cases, uh, proposers do not show that they are aware of. They might be aware of the state of the art, but they do not show it in the proposal. This is very important, that you show clearly that you're aware where the state of the art is and how you, your proposal can go beyond the state of the art. So I think uh, this, uh, these are the main recommendations that we have for, uh, for our topics. I think it's, I've already covered it in a few words, but I'll just quickly summarize. Again, make sure your objectives are very specific, precise, and measurable. Make sure that you know the state of the art and how you can go uh, beyond it. And make sure that you explain your methodology clearly. Uh, this brings us to the second uh, criterion that you will be judged again, against, and this is impact. Okay. Uh, we have a, a section in the topic description where uh, we have expected impact. And in many cases, proposers copy these uh, four bullet points uh, that we have, the text, and we, they say they will achieve these uh, impacts. This is not enough. Please make sure that you go beyond what we have in our, in our expected impa impacts. Please try to quantify uh, what your expected impact will be. Your vision that you have, uh, which is explained in the previous uh, part, in the excellence, uh, please try to identify what change it will bring to the industry, to the technology, and then try to quantify this change. Try to see how it will impact uh, the economy, your industry, uh, the technology in general. Try to see whether it will create new market opportunities, growth for your company, competitiveness, and of course the most obvious one, which is, will, be, will be the the protection of the environment and the reversal of climate change, which is clear in all of our topics. But ma please make sure that you quantify that and you state it clearly in your proposal. Uh, the second aspect of the impact is uh, an issue that is often neglected, and it's the exploitation, dissemination, and communication. Uh, Mirella will go into that in a lot more detail later on. But uh, please make sure that you don't neglect this. We have a dedicated section specifically for this reason. Uh, five pages where you can explain your plans for exploitation, dissemination, and communication. Make sure that these are clearly stated in that section. If you have any, pa any plans for patenting, uh, if you have any planned uh, dissemination activities, what is your targeted audience, uh, how do you plan to settle IPR issues between the consortium? Make sure that these are explained. And again, these are some failing comments from, uh, from reviewers for this criterion. As you can see, it's more or less on the issues I addressed. Impact is not adequately outlined. Uh, the impact is, of this project is expected to be low. 
If you don't state it in your proposals, the reviewers will not assume anything. They will not base uh, their judgments on the assessment of the first criterion. If you have a fantastic scientific approach and you have an excellent idea, they will not transpose this to the second criterion of impact. You must make it clear. You must make it, make it uh, quantifiable. Okay. It is not clear how the project will impact the industry. Make sure that you, uh, you address this issue. Uh, dissemination plan, IPR management not addressed. Make sure that these issues are addressed so that you show that you actually expect that you will exploit this project. Okay, and these are actually the recommendations uh, which I've, I think I've been going throughout my, my speech here. I've been mentioning these, but just to summarize and recap them, make sure that you have a dissemination plan that is clear. Uh, you have a targeted audience already predefined at your proposal stage. Make sure that you address any other socioeconomic impacts and you quantify them. And these are all important issues for this sec uh, section. This brings us to the, the fourth tip, uh, which is concerning the sound, budget, uh, sound plan and uh, budget uh, construction. This is uh, concerning the criterion of uh, quality and efficiency of implementation. Uh, there are some questions that you should keep in mind. Uh, is your requested uh, budget reasonable? We have many cases where uh, the budget is allocated, pre-allocated, uh, pre divided among the partners at the start of the proposal structure. And this is evident as the proposal is submitted. Please try to have a bottom-up approach. Start from your tasks. Uh, look at the effort that will re be required for the, each task and then allocate your, your, your resources accordingly. Uh, then you should also make sure that your plan is well defined. Uh, your milestones, your del deliverables are well set. Uh, as, you, as you have already uh, heard, we, do not, we no longer have a negotiation phase, so your proposal will be taken as it is. There is no second chance. You must be ready to execute the project plan that you present in your proposal. And the last point, is it sufficiently detailed? Make sure that you detail your proposal in all the important uh, cost items. Make sure if th something strikes out to you and you have allocated a significant amount of resources for some reason or another, make sure that you explain why that happens. So this is, as you can see, some of the comments that we have been receiving for this uh, criterion. Uh, the work plan is poor. There's no adequate structure. There's no risk analysis. Uh, an unbalanced consortium. This might be an unbalanced consortium uh, among uh, academia and industry, or it might be a consortium that is focusing too much on one country. Please may make sure that uh, the European dimension is respected, but please avoid having cosmetic partners that you have in included in your, in your proposal just to meet some requirements, and they're not actually useful. They're not actually contributing to your proposal. So, our recommendations, pretty obvious. Make sure that your work plan is as credible and as coherent as possible. Make sure that there are enough uh, deliverables, that they are positioned in uh, suitable stages along the project's lifetime. Make sure that these are easily quantifiable, and make sure also that you have enough public del deliverables. The, the, you're going to be using public money to fund this proposal. We must make sure that there is something that can be shared with the European community coming out from this project, sorry, from your proposals. Risks also need to be uh, taken into account. Think about having a risk matrix, think about having contingency plans. These are, again, things that might seem obvious to some, but we see cases where these have been uh, disregarded to a large extent. Oops. So this brings me to, to my last tip, which is a very generic say, remark. Uh, try to keep it as simple as, as possible. Uh, the reviewers will have to review uh, seven to nine proposals in, the, in, their, in their time of the evaluation. So try to keep uh, your messages as simple as possible, as digestible as possible. Uh, try to have, uh, the reviewers will probably not be native English speakers try to use simple language. There will be engineers, there will be scientists. So for that reason, they would like to see graphs. 
They will understand graphs. They will understand flow charts. Make sure that you're, if, if you have Gantt charts and pair charts, these are visible. We often see that uh, Gantt charts are too crowded. The reviewers cannot make sense of them. Pair diagrams are too complicated. Try to make them, break them down into simpler uh, steps. And at the end, uh, as uh, Lionel said, for the open research data, as open as possible, as closed as necessary, I will use the same motto for your, uh, the length of your proposal. Try to keep it as short as possible and as long as necessary. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will leave you now to the hands of our legal uh, officer that will talk to you about the legal and financial aspects of uh, your proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm here to speak to you about um, some uh, very few aspects regarding the legal framework in which you are about to enter if you are to submit a proposal and some financial aspects related to the budget that you must estimate now in when you submit a proposal. <coughs> this is an overview of uh, what I'm going to go through with you the legal and financial framework, uh, drafting the proposal, what about third parties, third parties, ethics, and additional activities, and then some financial aspects regarding the uh, um, <coughs> financial viability check, and one small uh, issue about IPR, who will be covered later on in a following presentation. Regarding the legal and financial framework, it is... Um, indeed a pyramid of legislation that applies to your proposal from the more, uh, moment you start drafting. We start with two um, EU regulations, which is the Horizon 2020 Establishing Regulation, which contains a set of rules on how the research and innovation uh, framework program is going to be implemented for all EU bodies uh, implementing this program, including the FCHJU, and then the regulation establishing the rules for participation. Now, this is very exhaustive um, regulation, let's say a piece of legislation, but is reflected later on in your grant agreement, in the sections of your proposal, the moment when you start drafting, in your uh, budget and categories of budget, in your eligibility of costs, and so on and so forth. The second um, element that you must take into consideration is, of course, the well-known annual work plan, or OPE, how we call it. Uh, this year is the OPE 2018, of course, which contains an additional set of rules applicable to each uh, topic uh, for the call management rules and so on and so forth. Then we also apply the general annexes to the main work program, 2018-2020, annexes from A to L, which have been covered by my colleague Lionel previously, which tells you which countries are eligible for funding, what about the evaluation rules, what are the types of actions, innovation, research and innovation, CSA, and so on, uh, open research data. Everything is in these general annexes and apply directly to your proposal. And then finally, at the end, uh, you have the model grant agreement, which is a contract, if you are successful, that you will sign with the FCHJU. Um, it is already made available to you, so you can read it thoroughly. Why? Because it is non-negotiable. Uh, this, uh, this grant will not change at all. You cannot come later on to say, I would like to uh, change this article or that article. This is not negotiable. Unfortunately, the grant is as such. It has been adopted through a commission decision and it is available from you from the beginning of the process so you can observe um, all the terms and conditions that are implied. Then for your further um, information, you have the so-called AGA, which is the acronym for the Annotated Grant Agreement, which takes you even further 
to explain um, the reasoning, information, interpretation of each and every article of the model grant agreement, should you have any doubts. And then, of course, under the same uh, category, you have the consortium agreement, which will govern the relationship between uh, the consortium partner, basically between yourselves, um, where you can devise further um, rights and obligations that are not included in the model grant agreement, like, for example, intellectual property, which can be further devised in the consortium agreement. Now, all of those are hyperlinks taking you to the um, regulations, the OPE, the general annexes, and the model grant agreement, except for the consortium agreement, because, of course, that is for you to draft and customize based on whichever model you want. The participant portal will offer you a model of the consortium agreement, but you are not obliged in any way to use that. It's completely free and up to you. Now, moving on from this general framework, it leads us to the next um, step that you should take in this um, uh, procedural uh, um, evaluation, which is, say, you have found a call, you have uh, um, registered your organization, you have found partners, and you are ready to submit a proposal. When you are ready to submit a proposal, you start with the uh, electronic submission uh, system, which is a wizard taking you step to step on how you're going to do it. And at one point, you have to download the templates for the part B, which is your technical uh, proposal, the technical annex, and a plan for dissemination and exploitation. These are two word templates that you have to fill in outside the system and then when you are ready, submit them and upload them in the electronic exchange system of submission. The technical annex is the most important <coughs> part. It, is, it comprises five sections. Excellence, impact, implementation, members of consortium, and ethics and security. And I will focus on two of them, implementations, implementation and members of the consortium, because they were mentioned later on on how important it is when you are writing, when uh, you are being assessed under the criterion efficiency and quality of the implementation to refer to these two sections. And I will further explain. And then you also have the template for the plan for dissemination and exploitation. Now be careful, this is an admissibility criterion as of this year with the general annexes. Should you not fill it in and upload it, your proposal is not admissible. Okay, moving on into this uh, technical proposal. What you need to know is the operational capacity. The operational capacity as an evaluation criterion, namely selection criteria, is embedded in the rules for participation, in an article in the rules for participation where it is stated, word per word, that the beneficiary must have the appropriate resources to implement the action. Now that translates into you having the correct operational capacity to carry out the work that you say you will do in your proposal. Of course, uh, as the general annex state, this operational capacity needs to exist at the moment where you implement the action. So should you not have the operational capacity when you draft, but you expect to have it when you start the implementation, you should explain how you will acquire that capacity, let's say in the few months time, when uh, you expect to start implementing the action if your proposal is successful. Now, that being said, there are um, four uh, exceptions where you can rely on third parties to help you implement the action. Now, these are purchase of uh, goods, works, services, subcontracts, linked third parties, and in-kind contributions. Again, your reliance upon third parties who are not a part of the consortium will be assessed under quality and efficiency of the implementation evaluation criterion. Yeah? 
And I will go to explain one by one to see where do they fit in your technical proposal and what you need to bear in mind. The first one is purchase of goods, works and services. Where do you need to fill this in? Well, in section 3.4, of your technical proposal. When you download it, you will see you have the five sections that I have just mentioned. If you go under section three and scroll down to 3.4 exactly, you will see you will have there uh, a chapter on resources needed to implement uh, the action. And there you have a table containing um, three uh, possible columns. The first one is travel costs and subsistence allowance. How much do you estimate you will spend on travel costs? Then a very, very important next item that you have to list is if you plan on using any piece of equipment, infrastructure, or other asset register as such in your accounting system, and here I emphasize the word asset, then the eligible cost, it is the depreciation as registered in your accounting system multiplied by the number of years used for the project. So your yearly depreciation times the number of years used in the project. This is for assets, yes? Uh, and then you have the costs another column for uh, other goods and services, meaning consumables, supplies, for which you will also need to give an estimate budget. Of course, these will all be based on best value for money, and uh, we will uh, later develop on this uh, should your uh, proposal be successful. This is just for your information to, to know that uh, you will always have to select your contractors, your purchases, and best value for money for eligibility of costs. The next type of third party that you can rely on to carry out tasks in the project, as an exception should you not be able to, and for a limited part, of course, is the subcontracting. Where do you feel information about subcontracts? Well, it is in a different section than purchases. It's under section four, where you will have members of the consortium. And then 4.1. You will have to explain each member of the consortium, their capacity and so on. And then under 4.2, you will have a section called third parties involved in the action. And then another table asking you, do you plan on using subcontracts? If yes, explain. And then there, you should uh, put an estimate budget for the amount uh, to be subcontracted and the task or part of the task that you plan on subcontracting to a third party outside of the consortium. As mentioned previously by my colleague Nikos uh, earlier this morning, it can only be for a limited part. Of course, you cannot give <coughs> a critical or a big part of the tasks of a project to a subcontractor. This should always be with the beneficiaries. Of course, all subcontractors are based, should be also based on best value for money. And what is most relevant for you to know is that you cannot subcontract between consortium partners and you cannot subcontract to your affiliates. Whoever uh, is doing the job should charge the costs and not charge it to another beneficiary as a price because then we have a risk of the grant producing profit. The next type of third party, which is in exactly the same uh, table as subcontracts, immediately after the question, are you going to use subcontracts, you have the question, are you going to use linked third parties? So it's in the same section 4.2 of the technical annex. It's further explained in Article 14 of the Model Grant Agreement if you really have a curiosity to see it um, more in depth. Um, it is uh, regarding affiliated entities or um, <coughs> companies with a legal link that you can use in the project for implementing <coughs> tasks. The rules that apply to beneficiaries apply also to linked third party, meaning that they must come also from an eligible uh, country um, for their costs 
uh, to be um, accepted and reimbursed, they can only charge the cost, not a price, yes? And uh, an estimation of their costs should also be included in that table. Another type of third parties is the in-kind contributors. Now, what does it mean? It's the third row of that same uh, table where you are being asked, are you planning to use any in-kind contributors? Now, what does that mean? It means seconded persons, contributed equipment, or other contributed goods and services. To make this a little bit easier to understand, there is an example which is offered also by the annotated grant agreement. So it, the, let's say the extensive document tries to help you by giving examples. For example, the case of a public uh, servant who is employed by a ministry and who is detached, who is seconded to a university where he works as a professor. That university, should he, that they be a beneficiary in the grant and use the professor as personnel in the grant, in the proposal, he can charge the cost of the salary of the professor to the grant. It's not their own employee, but is seconded from another entity and the cost is eligible under in-kind contributor. And as of this year, with the new model grant agreement that we have implemented with this call, we have a new category of third parties. It's stemming from the um, open to the world um, vision of uh, Horizon 2020. It's international partners. Uh, they are any legal entity established in countries that are non-eligible for funding. What does that mean? It means that they can participate into projects, not as beneficiaries, but as third parties. And they will be in the same section 4.2. You'll be asked, are you planning to use international partners? Their costs will not be reimbursed. And they will not be taken into calculation for the total amount of the grant. However, for example, you have a collaboration with a research institute of New Zealand. They have their own program in New Zealand, but they are interested in working together with you in this grant. They will not become a beneficiary, they're not interested, but they're interested in the work. You have this possibility under international partners to include them in the tasks to be done. The last issue on the um, technical proposal that I encourage you to look at is ethics. Um, section 5 looks at ethics and security and everybody almost um, always think that they're safe from ethics, that there is no ethics issue, it's fine, we have no issue. It's true, but it's not only stem cells that have ethics issues. So if you have um, import export of equipment that needs uh, import export license, if you are using personal data that you are importing from country to country and you need to look at the data protection rules, this is the place where you need to look at that. There is a hyperlink on how to complete your ethics self-assessment guide where you have a list of issues. You just check if you fit in any of those boxes and that's it. This is a very easy um, step to, to do. The next thing that I would like to address that is um, easily forgotten in the proposal stage is that Additional activities needs to be declared in your uh, plan for dissemination and exploitation. Now, as mentioned, the plan for dissemination and exploitation is an admissibility criterion. If you have it, you will pass on. If not, you are not admissible. If you are, uh, who needs to declare these additional activities? Um, they need to be declared only by non-members of Hydrogen Europe or Hydrogen Europe Research and they need to be included as part of each participant business plan. You have clear instructions in italic in the template. 
if you open the template for plan for dissemination and exploitation, you have there under the business plan a, a paragraph asking you about additional activities, what you should declare, and uh, what we are going to do with this information. Now, for your general knowledge, additional activities, uh, we ask because we would like to know if outside our work plans, outside the FCHJU, you are going to undertake some activities in the fuel cell and hydrogen sector that gives us uh, an idea of what is the impact, impact outside of our program and what is the leverage. Now, uh, this is an estimate. We ask only because we would like to know, know the impact and we will never audit this. It's just an estimation that we would like to know at this stage and we will ask you again at the end of the uh, project duration if you are successful, also as an estimation and also without auditing. Now I come to the financial viability check. Yes, the financial viability check, if you are a coordinator, we really, really encourage you that you do the self-assessment. You have a hyperlink there, just click it. Do see if you are um, weak or insufficient, indeed you cannot take the coordinating role and you will um, then um, avoid some issues in the future when you will have to be changed. And last, I think, for open access to publications, which you know is mandatory, and open access to research data, which you know is the default option, budget these costs. They are eligible for both categories and please include them in your estimation of budget. Not to realize later on that in fact I have not included this and I don't think I will participate in open research data because I didn't budget it. Think about it in advance and include an estimate costs of this category therein. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgiana. So it's time to talk more about this plan for dissemination, exploitation of results, including communication. We've heard from our colleagues already about uh, how to submit, how to register, uh, outmissibility criteria, and we heard about this plan several times. I would like to emphasize the importance of the plan. You might have uh, experience in Horizon 2020, other programs of Horizon 2020. And you might have not necessarily seen this plan as a separate document required by the proposal. This is our own initiative, and we insist on having this plan separate. I believe it's very important that we make aware to you that uh, you should deserve, uh, you should um, put aside some time and build a proper plan for dissemination, exploitation, and including communication activities. In the past, and this is a, a feedback which we got from previous evaluations, this part of the proposal was mistreated. I can say that. I think we were getting, in most of the cases, half a page dedicated to these aspects. And these were... These are, on one side, very important to the impact of your proposal, so when the proposal is evaluated, but on the other side, very important to our program in general. I believe <clears throat> we do not disseminate and communicate enough, and I believe we are not very aware of how to exploit the results of our projects. And here I'm speaking on behalf of the other half of my team, which is the communication officer, the fin uh, financial engineer, and the knowledge manager. So we also have this type of activities, and when I encourage you to read the whole document, I encourage you to read also from this point of view, because we do not only do projects to do the projects and to take the grant money. We do it because we are part of a big machinery, and we have to communicate to the taxpayers money how we spend uh, and why, and which are the results of our projects, and to disseminate also to the community that somebody can use some of our results. This is ultimately public money, but also to be aware on how to exploit the results. So I will move into the details. Uh, unfortunately, I will have to refer to a grant agreement article 
So whenever you, you will sign with us later uh, a grant, you have to be aware that you must, and this is a very strong word, you must promote the action and its results by providing uh, targeted information to multiple audiences. So we are also used from the past, because we are scientists, most of us, we are used to talk to ourselves or to our community. We have to get out of the bubble. We have to be able to show what we have done, especially if we have done good results. Um, and I, we have also noticed that there's a big confusion between what means communication and what means dissemination. And I want to make it very clear. Communication, it's about projects and results, while dissemination, it's results only. So please make this difference, because you might believe that if you have a work package on dissemination, that's enough. It's not. This only refers to dissemination. The other two aspects, communication and exploitation of results, are not addressed. And again, your proposal will be affected in terms of evaluation because the experts will be required to look at all three aspects. Okay? What do we mean by communication? We mean about multiple audiences, and here, special emphasis is on media and public because that means communication. Again, we are lacking public awareness, and especially in our domain, in fuel cell and hydrogen. I don't think the public is fully aware of what we are doing here, because we do not do sufficient communication, because we mainly do dissemination. And dissemination meaning because we go in conferences with publications, and again, we talk to ourselves. We should get out of the bubble and do more communication. And I will come in a minute and I will explain to you how. And here I put also exploitation of results, and I put all three to really see the difference. And I would like you to, to look at that before you think in your proposal how to address these three. And I, again, I would like to remind to you, I lost the mic. I, again, I would like to remind to you that this uh, is again under the impact. These are measures to maximize the impact of your proposal. If you do not address these issues, you will be penalized under the impact criterion. Um, and now I'm coming to the draft, and I will come a bit into the details of each of them. The draft plan for dissemination exploitation of results has to have two main parts. In the first part is dissemination exploitation, in the second one it's communication. Under the dissemination exploitation of results, you have to mention first the area in which you ex expect to have impact and who are the potential users of your results. You might have the user of your results in the consortium, an industry who is interested in the results of the project. You have to mention how that industry is going, if successful, is going to use the results from the project. Is it going beyond maybe into a product? Is it going maybe for further research? You have to be aware what's happening at the end of your project and to have a plan for that. And then how you intend to use the appropriate channels of uh, dissemination and interaction with potential users. Again, why would you disseminate what you disseminate? And how will you interact with potential users if, again, the users are not in your project or if you want to have more than those users? You might produce a stack which might be used by different companies later. You have to have a plan on how you would like the stack at the end of the project to be used uh, by, by the users, okay? Um, you have to keep, uh, have consideration to the possible follow-up of your project once it's finished. A business plan or relevant, and here I, I mention the part of the additional activities, you have to have a business plan. I don't think any of the beneficiaries just do the project, just do our grant. This should be part of a bigger picture. And you have to tell us how our grant fits into the bigger picture, how your proposal fits in your bigger plans. Um, how you will manage the research data, which has been already explained by, by my colleague, and a strategy for knowledge management and protection. 
And finally, the, part, the second part of this plan should be communication activities. And you have to have a communication plan and measures and activities for promoting the project and its findings. On the dissemination, I'm not going to read that, just to remind you that this is an admissibility condition, this plan, and it's included in the impact criterion. It's a sub-criteria of the impact criterion, and I have seen proposals failing for this reason. Again, I draw to your attention, this is very important. It's not only the science of the proposal, it's also the path of the dissemination and communication. These are public money. Um, what is the dissemination and what is the exploitation? Just a small comparison when we talk about the two. The dissemination is the push, while the exploitation is the pull. That's how we should simply see it. The dissemination is a transfer of knowledge and results to the ones that can make best use of them, while the exploitation is make use of the results, recognizing them and the stakeholders that could use them. Uh, again, in terms of definition, the dissemination is a public disclosure of the results by any appropriate means including scientific publications. This is mostly what we have seen in our proposal. You do dissemination by presenting papers in different, or publications in different conferences. You can have other means of dissemination and please look at all the definition and the, all the other means and make a proper plan for dissemination. What means the exploitation is the utilization of results. So not, not, you do not only go somewhere and you say, this is what are my results, but you also make a plan of using them. When we talk about um, the barriers mainly are, again, and this is the reason of my presentation today, we do not make the distinction between these three aspects. I don't think it's very clear to everybody what means dissemination, what means exploitation, what means communication. And then we do not pay attention to it because we pay attention to the science. We pay attention on the work packages, we do the budget, and then we leave half a page for this. And then the proposal fails. And then we don't know why. Because we cannot show to the experts why we do what we do. Um, and here I will not go through because it has been covered already by my colleague, but in the same plan, you have also to address these two issues. Also in the, in the part uh, B of the proposal, but also in the plan. When we talk about communication, we also plan, and I think it's normal in all Horizon 2020, that we follow up on the communication from the proposal uh, phase. And again, I recommend, this is a, just a recommendation, I recommend you have a dedicated work package for communication, dissemination, and exploitation of results. So that's in the work package, you have the activities and the budget, while in the draft plan, you have the plan which includes more. As I said, it's past, part of the impact criterion, and we will ask for it, an update after each reporting period and under the project management of the, of the, of the project. Um, I'm not, I, I, you will have, like I said, the presentation for further reference. I just wanted to uh, mention to you two um, source reference, references for your further use. First is the Horizon 2020 guide on communication for all participants. So please read that. For commission takes also very serious this. I think in Europe we are not used to communicate enough about what we do. And I think Commission is also uh, pushing on this. So please read this as a Horizon 2020. But in addition, we have also a dedicated web page for communication, dissemination, exploitation of results. And I will also kindly recommend you to read it, where you also have uh, additional guidelines from ourselves, including proposal for branding of equipment, prototypes, and pilot plans. And here I'm coming to the end of my presentation. We are here a bit disappointed, and I'm careful when I'm using my words. We are disappointed the way our projects are communicating 
about us and acknowledging our support. And it's not only us, FCHGU is a commission also in general. We have seen communications given by our projects and not a proper acknowledgement to our funding and to the European Union funding. So these are the rules. I have made refer oops, sorry. I have made reference to the article. It's an article of the grant agreement. And we are considering inside the FCSGU to start applying measures for not complying with this article. I don't think so far we have done it enough. I think people were communicating and getting paid by us for doing that without acknowledgement of our funding. So these are the obligation. Oops, you have to use the EU emblem. You have to use our emblem. You have to use this text, which is provided to you also on our webpage. And of course, when using this as compared to your logos, please use them in a normal size. So not our emblems, just put somewhere in the corner and say it's acknowledged, no. So we will start applying the measures. So please be aware of these things because we will not pay for these activities anymore. If a proper acknowledgement and a proper communication is not done by our projects. I know I sound a bit uh, tough, but I think we have to, be, uh, to take some measures because I think we have not shown to the public at large, to the EU taxpayers, and ultimately to the, ta to the policymakers, that our program is a good program with good results and with good impact. And this is affecting our future. So this is my last message, and I would like to pay attention to that, because, and not to be surprised if your proposal fails, <laughs> because you haven't paid attention to that. Thank you very much. Now we move to uh, our guests, <laughs> I will say. Uh, we move to our colleagues from the IPR help desk to give us some insights on the IPR. Thank you very much. Hey, bonjour, hello. Um, this is Onur from the European IPR help desk. And maybe some of you might be a bit uh, flurried about the, uh, about the lunch, but uh, actually I'll be a bit more uh, making a bit of weight for this because I'll be adding some salt to your expectations about lunch. And I'll be speaking about a bit about intellectual property rights. And maybe some of you may think that, uh, OK, we have just uh, been informed about the, uh, about the call. We haven't even found out our consortium. So, OK, what the hell this, uh, this uh, guy is talking about, intellectual property rights? I mean, you know, we are not in, the, in this point. However, this is not true, and I'm here to show you that this is actually, I mean, intellectual property rights is very, very important, even at the beginning of your projects. But before this, let me introduce the European IP Help Desk, because I'm pretty sure that not many of you know uh, the European IP Help Desk. And actually, the European IP Help Desk is the service, the official intellectual property service initiative of the European Commission. Actually, we are a project as well, but we are acting as the uh, service initiative of the European Commission. And we are supporting European SMEs and all um, beneficiaries of the uh, EU-funded projects uh, within, their, uh, within their questions regarding intellectual property rights. OK, and our services are uh, first of all, we have a website. Actually, this is the hub of intellectual property rights. So just visit our website, which is iprhelpdesk.eu. So you can visit our website, and you can see all our publications and all our events and all our services there. Uh, we have different types of publications. I won't enter, the, uh, I won't enter this uh, in detail. Uh, we have uh, periodical uh, bulletins and newsletters. We have a helpline, which is quite good because uh, you may ask your specific intellectual property questions to our helpline and you'll get your uh, answers within three working days from our lawyers and attorneys uh, and it is all free of charge. So this is quite, uh, I guess, uh, beneficial for you and for all the beneficiaries of EU-funded projects. And also we are providing training events. We are trying to, you know, uh, participate in 
many events like this in order to increase awareness about intellectual property rights and about our services. However, we are also uh, we have also like webinars uh, online, so you can just check our calendar. And also, we are uh, trying to participate. Uh, we are trying to organize lots of training events, and then you can participate in uh, one of our events for sure. So, so all you need to do is just check our uh, our calendar. Okay, this is our website, and yeah, as I said, this is our helpline, so please call our helpline or send us an email, and you'll get your answers as, uh, as uh, early as possible in three working days. And this is our next, our next program, our next webinar program. Uh, so we'll, uh, for February, we have an IP commercialization and licensing webinar, so you can uh, register to our webinars from our website. Anyway, you'll get this, uh, this uh, presentation later on, I guess, so you can uh, have all the links uh, on this presentation, after all. And, yes, I'm here uh, to add some salt to your negotiations, actually, and this salt is about intellectual property rights. Because normally when you are um, building up your consortium, it is actually like being on a blind date with your uh, feature girlfriend or boyfriend because you don't know each other very well but you but still you need to discuss the feature together and one of the issues that you need to discuss on the table is actually intellectual property rights and uh, we'll see how the European IP help desk will support you on your table by adding a pinch of salt uh, to your meals and then so that I means you can have a more tasty dinner and more tasty results at the end of your projects. Okay, you know um, the, the basic principle underneath of all Horizon 2020 projects, however, I mean, okay, this is a kind of, uh, uh, I'm always saying Horizon 2020 there, but when I'm saying Horizon 2020, please take it as FCH projects because especially within the framework of uh, intellectual property rights, the, the issues and the rules are totally the same with Horizon 2020. So just when I'm saying Horizon 2020 there, take it as FCH projects. So in all projects, you are bringing something and your partners are also bringing something to the table and you are trying to create something new with the support of your own knowledges. And when you are speaking about knowledges, actually you are talking about intellectual property rights. So uh, there are some rules for sure might be a bit boring for you, but uh, these are very important rules set by the European Commission. And you can find those rules, the intellectual property rules, in three main documents. One of which is the rules for participation. This is the main framework of rules, actually. And then the second one is the model grant agreement and the annotated grant agreement, AGA. And then you can, I mean, these are actually the default rules and the general rules of intellectual property rights. Uh, actually, the IP rules are after section three. And then the applicable work program, which is FCH program in this case, which sets out the specific rules. Yeah, you can find them on the participant portal. So, you are on the table with, with your blind dates, with your consortium, pro possible consortium partners, and uh, you have the menu that you need to discuss together with your consortium partners. And let's see what is written on the menu. Background, results, access rights, exploitation, and dissemination. So you need to discuss these issues on the table. Here are the definitions, very short definitions regarding these issues. So the background is what is already in your pocket before uh, standing uh, on the table. Results, what will be generated after the project, and also during the project for sure. Uh, and actually it was known as foreground before in FP7, but now it's called as results. The access rights, uh, it is actually how your partners can reach to your pocket, can reach to your background, and uh, how they can reach to the results that you have generated. The exploitation is actually how you can make effectively use of the results, and the dissemination is the public disclosure. 
So, okay, actually this part of the intellectual property rights is um, more or less an, uh, an hour long of training, so we don't have much time for this. So I'll try to cover these issues in just a couple of uh, frequently asked questions. So you'll see some questions and very simple answers and how we support as European IP help desk when you are asking these questions. You'll see this uh, on, uh, in the upcoming slides. So the first question is a very simple question which has a very simple answer. Who is the owner of the background? The, the, the knowledge, the intellectual property rights that you already have. Who is the owner of it? Simple question, simple answer. Who brings this table, this to the table, is actually the owner of the uh, background. So, uh, the principle is simple, true, but in order to uh, prove that this background is owned by yourself, you need to identify your background. You need to identify your intellectual property rights before standing on the table. This is very important. Uh, actually, this is a must. So you need to identify them, your background. And for this, you may use some uh, forms to, uh, to identify your background, which can be a positive or a negative list, a separate agreement in the CA saying that these patents, these trademarks, these uh, intellectual property rights are owned by this partner and the others are owned by the other partner. So this is very important and it is a must that you need to identify your background in writing in a consortium agreement or in a separate agreement. This is very important. Second question. I have a very innovative idea and very innovational idea and uh, I'm going to use it with my consortium partners during the project but you know, I need to disclose it during the project to, to the partners in order to let them use it. How can I do this? How can I be sure, how can I safeguard my background against my consortium partners? The answer, first of all, if these knowledge are actually is registrable, please register them. I'm saying this because some knowledge cannot be registrable, like know-how or uh, like, uh, I don't know, like ideas. So in such a case, please treat them as a confidential information, which means that you need to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with your partners. This is particularly important within the negotiation stage because you will never be sure you are on the table, but you'll be never sure that the, 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 the counterpart uh, on the table will be your partner or not you'll be never be sure about it. You are just negotiating the consortium. So you need to sign an NDA uh, about your background in order, to allow, in order not to allow them to disclose your background after the, the, after the negotiations or after the, the project. So this is very important. Please sign an NDA. Yes, if it's registrable, register them uh, for the background. As I said, please identify them. This is very important. And uh, please um, uh, co conclude an NDA or a memorandum of understanding in order to safeguard your knowledge. How we are supporting you, how we are putting on salt uh, on this as European RP Help Desk, we have, as I said, we have publications and we have uh, three fact sheets regarding this. Our fact sheets are very uh, written in a, because you know, intellectual property rights is not the easiest topic for sure because it requires science, law, and so on. So it is not the, the, um, the most easiest thing, but we are trying to keep everything as simple as possible. You'll see, even if you don't know anything about intellectual property rights, you can easily understand what is written and what is required by the European Commission regarding intellectual property rights. So do please check one of our fact sheets and you'll see it on your own eyes actually. Uh, for this part, for this negotiation part, for the background part, you can download our fact sheets. One is on fact trade secrets, the other one is on how to manage confidential business information, and the other one is about non-disclosure agreements, how to draft a non-disclosure agreement. We also have here a non-disclosure agreement template, and uh, we also have intellectual property ch uh, rights charts, uh, which is about what is a patent, how you can register it, what is a trademark, 
how we can register it, and what is a design, and how we can register it. So uh, you can uh, get uh, you you can just make use of all our documents from our website. Question three. Maybe this is a bit harder one. Uh, this is about okay. We have developed something very new during the project, during the course of the project. Uh, but you know, this is the nature of uh, scientific projects, research projects. How we can be sure about the relative contribution of the results? Because normally, okay, you are producing the result, and you are saying that okay, I am producing that part. I, I am the owner of this. He is producing producing that part, he is the owner of it. But normally it is not really possible, especially for research projects, to uh, differentiate the relative contribution. So how you can do this? For this, you need to sign, you need to conclude a, uh, an agreement which is called a joint ownership agreement. So you need to discuss uh, the joint ownership rules beforehand. And here are the things that you need to consider before uh, drafting a joint ownership agreement. Actually, these are the topics that you need to uh, discuss and draft on your uh, joint ownership agreement. I won't enter the details because I don't have much time. Uh, yeah, this part is important, quite important, because fine tuning, okay, you may discuss it because you are still in the negotiation process. And you may think that, okay, I cannot, I mean, I'm not able to see, foresee all the results that, uh, that we are going to develop. And we are not very sure about this. In such a case, okay, it is for sure understandable. Uh, and uh, it is always possible to make fine tuning at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the project. So this is very important. I mean, it is uh, fine tuning possible after the results are generated. So this is actually uh, very important. And how we add our salt. Uh, we have a fact sheet again about IP joint ownership. So it is about how you can draft a joint ownership agreement. So you can see some tips on the, uh, the agreement of uh, joint ownership. The last question. Actually, it was I mean, underlined many times before, so I won't enter into details, but this is about the IP part of PEDR, Plan for Exploitation and Dissemination of Results. Uh, this is a must. This is very important. So uh, you need to uh, exploit and disseminate your results uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and you have this obligation even after the project, because you have still four years. And even after the end of the project, you need to plan uh, the uh, after four years of the project. This is very important. And how we add our salt again. We have fact sheets on plan for exp uh, exploitation and dissemination of results, PEDR, how you can draft it. So please check our fact sheet. We have uh, a fact sheet on exploitation channels for public research results. And we have another fact sheet on open access, which is a type of uh, exploitation of results. If you need some more salt still, we have an IP guide on Horizon 2020 which is quite a nice guide, I mean, very handy guide, but you can download it on our website, and it covers everything regarding intellectual property rights uh, and everything that you may consider during the course of your project. So please download this from our website. And if you still have some more salt, uh, then, okay, please contact our helpline and ask your questions directly to our helpline. I'll be here during the course of the lunch, so if you have some questions, you can have my card and uh, we can initiate our contacts. Okay, this might be a bit salty presentation, but still, uh, World Health Organization says that please keep your salt intake not more than five grams because it is against your whole, uh, health. Thank you very much, this is all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that was a very interesting presentation, especially that you can see that there are already some fact sheets or guidelines that the IPR help desk has developed and that you can use for everything that you have to deal with, especially in the consortium agreement, but also in what I just explained before, the plan for exploitation and dissemination of results. 
I will give now the floor to our uh, next guests, uh, and it's uh, our two members, Hydrogen Europe and Hydrogen Europe Research. And I have here uh, Thierry from the Hydrogen Europe Research, and I think Sabrine from the Hydrogen Europe. Yes, who goes first? <laughs> Thank you, Mira. Okay, okay, so uh, I start by presenting you uh, Hydrogen Europe research. And maybe as you know, the uh, FCRGU is organized, uh, of course, uh, as Mirella explained, uh, and managed by the, uh, the program office, of course, uh, and the commission, but also with two, uh, two main uh, associations, an uh, uh, industry group ring uh, called uh, as Hydrogen Europe, and you will have a short presentation just after, and uh, the research grouping called uh, Hydrogen Europe Research, and uh, previously a name, and you maybe you, you knew it as uh, formerly Energy. Okay, which is our mission of uh, Hydrogen Europe Research? Uh, our mission, it's, uh, uh, first of all, is to, uh, to strengthen the uh, European uh, research on hydrogen and fuel cells and merging all our skill and to, to exchange uh, what, uh, what we can do all together. And of course, to be the, the counterpart of the industry uh, during the discussion with the program office and the commission when uh, preparing the, the, new, uh, the new call as we just start for the OP19 uh, just now. Next one. So who are we? We are composed of 68 uh, members, maybe seven or nine, depends sometimes on new, there are newcomers and some, some of them are leaving. Uh, we, are, uh, we represent 18 uh, countries uh, all, uh, all over Europe. And uh, here is the, the list, uh, you have the slide so we can maybe recognize uh, your, uh, your own logo. And uh, it's a present situation. Of course, uh, we would like to, uh, to increase the number of uh, uh, our partners. So feel free to, to contact us if you want to join us. Uh, it will, you will be very, very welcome if you want, you want to, to, to do so. So how uh, we are organized, uh, of course, all the, uh, the members or the partners uh, could join us uh, twice uh, a year during the, the General Assembly. And uh, uh, every two years, the General Assembly elected a new, uh, a new board composed of a, a president and a vice president and a treasurer, uh, chair and vice chair for the different uh, pillar of, uh, of surgery program, transport, energy. We have also, uh, some, uh, some people uh, <coughs> dealing with uh, cross-cutting uh, and external affairs. And uh, how you as members, uh, could you uh, involve, could you be involved in, in, in the process? So, in fact, uh, uh, everyone from uh, uh, Hydrogen Europe Research can join the so-called uh, working group. So that means if one of you are volunteers to join transport uh, working group or uh, energy pro, uh, working group, so please uh, go to our website and uh, ask to, to join the, the working group. And, well, uh, what you have to do in the working group is to be involved from the beginning to the end in the process of the uh, selection of the topic and in the, uh, the drafting of the future calls. So at the beginning, it's something we, we just start with our colleagues from uh, industry in a, in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks, to ask everyone, members from research and industry, to send us what we call the rationale. It could be the future description or what would be the future topics in the next call for the 1990 uh, call. So, which are the, the benefits from our members? Uh, for two main, uh, two main benefits, uh, of course. First of all, is to uh, is to be involved from the beginning to the, uh, the drafting of uh, of a future uh, future call, and of course to be aware of uh, what uh, what will be the future calls in advance for people who are not members of uh, industry and uh, research grouping, and of course during the general assembly or or the day like this one. To, uh, to exchange with, with others, with other partners from research, and of course, with other partners from, uh, from industry. So now, I leave the floor to uh, Hydrogen Europe industry to have uh, the counterpart of uh, what we are doing. 
Thank you, Thierry, and uh, thanks for welcoming us. I'll do my best to be short, because I know that you have. Uh, we have been through a very busy morning, and everyone is looking forward to lunch. I think there is one last speaker after me, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I'll do my best. So that's actually research. Oh, OK. But that, well, that's not the right presentation. So how do I move to my presentation? Was this in continuation of the previous one? I can start anyway, because uh, we all want to have lunch soon. So who we are, Hydrogen Europe, we are a Brussels-based association. Our office has just been relocated in this building, actually uh, behind the reception desk, so feel free to come and say hi. Uh, we are uh, the voice of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies in Brussels. So what does it mean? It means that we try as much as possible to promote hydrogen and fuel cell technologies in Europe, across um, well, the different directorate generals, in the commission, in the parliament, towards different stakeholders, and trying to build alliances also with other um, associations. So this is basically the two points, uh, okay, thank you. The two points that I was about to say that are in there, but it's not in, yeah, yep, exactly. Oh, too quick. Exactly, so I was talking about our mission and so it's from awareness raising, because you might have experimented this as well. What is hydrogen? What is a fuel cell? Most of the people still will look at you outside of our community and be like, no idea. So from awareness raising to advocacy, networking, obviously, and then from the market side is let's push to commercialize our products and let's explain also to the main stakeholders that some products are actually closer to the markets and what they think. Uh, the last point is yeah, also pretty important, the access to finance one. How can we help you help our sector um, to, yeah, to get the proper funding, uh, link with investors, etc. So if I want to just say two key roles or maybe two pillars, I would say that we have on one hand the policy and communication. That's our advocacy parts. As a keyword, lobbying, I would just quote uh, the Clean Energy Directive Review, the Mobility Package, the Post-2020 Innovation Program, that things we are busy with on a daily, uh, on a daily basis. Happy to discuss this afterwards uh, during the lunch break. But here, the main focus today is the second pillar, which is the innovation pillar, and that's FCAGU Matters. Uh, one word about our membership, over 130. Uh, members from startups, SMEs, to multinational organizations, as well as uh, um, hydrogen associations. Uh, we have reached, uh, yeah, now we have 10 hydrogen national associations. Oops, too quick. I'm just too. So I will skip that one just to say we have one body, uh, one body, three heads. Uh, so we are a strange animal with. Research Industry Commission. What is our role in the FCHGU? Uh, um, I guess Thierry summarized it very nicely, the first one, so setting priorities in the call. It's basically, we try to, uh, well, we shape the calls for 2019 now for the moment with uh, dedicated committees. Um, well, I will, well, you can see them on the slide. We have five committees where both industry and research are working uh, hand in hand to make the best, um, yeah, to find the best calls possible and shape the best calls possible. Um, secondly, we built uh, commercialization strategies by this, and this was very nicely mentioned by, by Mirella before. Um, great, you have projects, you have project results. What do we do with these results? We need to um, bring them to the <laughs> outside of the, of the scientific community, bring them to the stakeholders, and what does it mean? Does it have an impact on the type of projects we can commercialize or not? What is the strategy? So we bring, we use all of those results and we also um, sometimes think about, does it make sense to make a special study on a dedicated subtopic, like they were in the, in the past already? Um, and then there we provide um, yeah, inputs on, the, on, the, on, those type, on those studies. And last but not least, obviously, to provide uh, expert advice 
it's pretty obvious. So now I'll try to explain the project fee. So some of you might, uh, if you, ha you have already participated, you have you're already aware of this, there is a project fee to be paid. So why, why, <laughs> why is this? So we have to remember ourselves that we are quite um, privileged as a sector because we have um, at European level a dedicated EU budget. We have the right to define our funding priorities, as I was saying, via the technical committees. Via we have the right to exactly shape what do we want for our sector. And we have a dedicated body to actually, with a very skilled team from the program office, who is there to deliver all of this. So obviously, this cannot come without any obligations. So in the EU regulation, we have the obligation to demonstrate a level of uh, further investment. And Georgiana explained this beforehand with the in-kind contribution and the additional activities. And we have to contribute to the cost of the joint undertaking. So meaning the cost of the program office. And the project fee is used for this purpose. Um, so what's the project fee? Uh, there has been, uh, I'm sure, a lot of ref a reflection around how to make this the first possible. It's a, a fee sorry, that is paid by all participants and equally according to the received support, I mean, proportional to the, to the support. Um, and that corresponds to 4% uh, of the FCAGU grant that is paid by all participants. So who manages the project fee? Hydrogen Europe in collaboration with Hydrogen Europe Research. Um, so you might see uh, yeah, a lot of emails coming from our secretariat in the next uh, weeks, months, etc. Um, and this is used, I have to stress that, I mean, we are not using that money for, uh, I know, for our new office or anything. It's used really exclusively to fulfill the obligations towards the FCAGU. And why am I saying all that? Because you could say, well, that's something to be think about uh, in the future. We first get the project and then we start thinking about it. It's quite important to have this in mind in your planning because you should have this 4% in mind when you prepare your budget. It's quite straightforward. And the project fee will be collected afterwards uh, after the signature of the grant agreement. So that's my last slide, actually. Of course, it's also a nice uh, opportunity to actually tell us why, if you're not there yet a member of Hydrogen Europe, we really believe it would make sense for you to join us. And uh, again, don't hesitate, I will be around at lunchtime. Uh, well, first of all, it's a bit of this. Sorry, it's a bit of the same as for the from the research side. You get a privileged access to the calls, uh, to shaping the calls. Obviously, it doesn't mean that if you have a great idea, uh, you're the only one, and you have no money and no investor, no one to support you, your <laughs> idea will get through. But we will do our best to actually make the best uh, possible proposals. Uh, second one is the one that I didn't that I mentioned really briefly today is the fact that we do our best to shape EU and sometimes also national legislation towards more, uh, yeah, more support for hydrogen fuel cell technologies with yeah, daily, really daily advocacy works towards um, the main stakeholders in Brussels and BIT, uh, EU institutions, etc. cetera. Um, you, also have, you will also have the, the opportunity to participate in a platform to exchange knowledge with the industry, I mean, with other companies, other associations, you might find uh, new business partners, new opportunities via this, um, this network that we offer you. It's also a way to raise your profile, as we will invite you, I mean, whenever it makes sense to speak at events, to also, um, I mean, we will also raise if there is any very good uh, business developments that we can highlight, we will highlight it via our channels and uh, it, and, and then the last one is pretty obvious, is that you will get from us all uh, relevant information about the sector and we will be at your service, as I said, behind the, <laughs> behind the reception. Um, easy to find, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you.
Thank you both, uh, Thierry and uh, Sabrine. And I would like now to give the floor to our last speaker, who's uh, speaking on behalf of the national contact points, uh, meaning experts in the field in every single member state in the countries, and to, to show to you how they can also help you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the FCHJU uh, who can be here to present the um, C Energy 2020 um, NCP Network for Energy. My name is Simon Zerovi. I'm a um, German national contact point uh, employee uh, in the field of energy. So the um, C Energy 2020 NCP network itself, it's uh, Horizon um, 2020 uh, coordination and support action project, and they are gathered together. Um, they are professionals um, and experts uh, responsible to inform and advise um, stakeholders and um, applicants um, on um, the societal challenge three: secure, clean, and efficient energy. Uh, in Horizon 2020. In this position, uh, we are recognized by the EU member states um, and the European Commission as well. And uh, what can we do for you? We provide you with guidance and support uh, in your own language. Oh. So, um, we heard a lot uh, in the last uh, presentations about um, the rules for participation. We heard a lot about do's and don'ts. And what we primarily offer you is um, to support you uh, during the proposal drafting. Um, first, with information about uh, identifying um, the right call and topic for the project ideas. And secondly, during the um, application process. So we, we try that you um, implement the do's we, we heard before in the presentations. And uh, we'd like to help you to avoid the don'ts. So there, um, we support you. And uh, in this uh, position, we are um, free of charge, we are neutral uh, and confidential. Um, and as you see here, we are present in all European countries, so it's easily to get in, in touch with us with the local um, NCP in your um, home country. And there you can uh, get information and help uh, all about um, topics in Horizon 2020 concerning the secure, clean and efficient energy um, work program, and this includes the FCH energy topics. So, furthermore, in, in uh, this position, we, we got a lot of information um, on uh, background information on the political side and about upcoming calls and uh, specific issues concerning the energy challenge. And so we can help you to, uh, for instance, understand uh, an important uh, part, dissemination communication on project results and this um, service are not mentioned uh, so far today. There exists the common exploitation booster or the support service for exploitation of research results specific for uh, energy topics in the field um, of the Horizon 2020 energy um, calls. And this service will also uh, support you and provide you with uh, guidance on um, dissemination and exploitation issues. Um, one further political issue right now, as uh, a set plan, key actions. Um, they're right now working on implementation plans and uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions also on national levels. And there we have further information and there are also key actions um, concerning um, FCH activities, namely energy efficiency in buildings, energy efficiency for industry, and the renewable fuels. And also there we can provide you with additional background information. So the um, easiest way to get in contact with us is our website. This is a platform where you find all uh, contact information and uh, further information. Just go on uh, www. 
dot c energy uh, c minus energy 2020 dot eu there you find all um, informations about the local ncp we have established a partner search tool and you can register on the partner search tool this is um, specific for the energy topic and energy related topic uh, in horizon 2020 so uh, there you have um, a lot of um, opportunities to get in touch in contact with uh, people and to share your project ideas and hopefully to find partners and to build a consortium. And of course, there on the um, web page you find further information about uh, further opportunities and support structures as the Enterprise Europe Network or other f information about other funding programs as the st uh, structural funds. So, with this, um, I'd like to thank you for the kind attention and hopefully uh, we will come to lunch right now. Thanks. Thank you. So that was a, we also have to talk about the transport path. Okay. Sorry for that. So I will keep you just a bit more, not much, I promise. So, uh, my name is Luis Maia, I'm the Portuguese NCP for Transport and Energy. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about our, another uh, network of uh, NCPs, which is the Etna 2020 network, which is dedicated to the area of transport. So, uh, is this working? Ah, okay. So what is Aetna uh, 2020? Uh, my uh, German colleague has already told you a bit about what we do as NCPs, so I'm not going to extend much uh, on that. But just to give you a general idea, Aetna 2020 is our network of national contact points for the area of transport. And uh, uh, of course, the, the objective is to increase the participation of all stakeholders in Horizon 2020 and of course also associated joint undertakings like uh, fuel cells. And uh, to support participation, uh, increase awareness, uh, organize activities, etc. Um, my presentation is going to be focused on what is our main instrument and let's say our main gateway for stakeholders to know us, which is our website, the Aetna 2020 website. Uh, you can uh, see the link in the presentation, which will be sent to you after the event. And uh, our website is based on a set of tools that can uh, help you to participate in topics related with transport in Horizon 2020. And uh, you can see these tools in this bar under, under the website. We have Finder NCP, Transport uh, Netscape, Events, etc. And I'm going to describe each of these tools in the next slides. First of all, Finder NCP. Uh, you've seen that the energy network has something similar also. So in here you can find uh, which are which is your nat national NCPs, not only for EU countries and uh, associated states, but also for third countries, the ones which have NCPs. And this can be useful, for example, if you need to have a project with China. And for example, now we have many in the uh, 18 in the 2018 call. We have many topics that request. Uh, that you have Chinese partner. And so you can, for example, contact the Chinese partner, Chinese NCPs to help you with this, with this process to, to find a Chinese partner. Uh, next, we have uh, EU Transport Landscape, which uh, I think it's a useful uh, tool to find a bit more about the, the re reality of EU uh, landscape in the area of transport. Because as you all know, it gets, there are many instruments, uh, it gets a bit confusing, especially if you're new. So here you can see, you see what are the European technological platforms in the area of transport that have a major impact in defining the work programs. Public-private uh, partnerships like JUs, like for example the fuel cell, uh, this one, and hydrogen initiative. Airnets that are active and other useful links. So it's a, a great way to get to know your way around the transport sector in Europe. Partner searches. Uh, as also referred in the, um, in the energy network, in the transport network we also have a partner search engine. And I'm not going into details, but you can search, you can insert your ideas for a specific topic that is present in participant portal. Or you can just uh, uh, say that you're interested in, in this topic without having an idea, and maybe you can find partners that way. So it can be a very useful tool to build your consortium and to find uh, the partners that you need. Uh, which, so Aetna 2020 organized a set of uh, events, 
mostly to disseminate Horizon, to give support, to give training. So we have our brokerage events. Usually we, we organize these uh, brokerage events in coordination with the inf Transport Info Days. The last one was on December, 13th of December. Uh, in, uh, it was connected with the Transport Info Day event here in Brussels. And we're going to have a brokerage event uh, in the Transportation Research Arena Conference that's going to take place in uh, Brussels, in Vienna, which is the biggest uh, European co um, conference on transport. And it happens every two years. So Aetna 2020 is going to be there. We also organize training we uh, webinars and other types of training, either generic trainings for all stakeholders or trainings for NCPs, to train other NCPs that may not be a part of the Aetna network. Lastly, we have the Aetna Academy, which the idea here is to help uh, proposers improve their proposals before submitting them with the help of evaluators. Toolbox. Again, more information about transport. I would uh, call your attention to this European Transport Organization's information in which you can find contact information for all the relevant uh, entities that work in the transport research uh, area in, tra in Europe. And uh, we know that there are a lot of them, so this can be very helpful to know who is who and who to contact. Also, Funding Map Database, it's a tool to, if you're looking to, for funding for your project in the area of transport, we have a quite comprehensible tool with a, a set of filters. You can choose which country do you want to fund this through, what kind of project, etc. And it will give you what are the available uh, funding tools in that, for that, that meets those specific requirements. Uh, last but uh, not least, the NCP twinning. Uh, Aetna 2020 uh, organized a set of uh, NCP twinning events in which the, the idea is to uh, get uh, uh, NCPs from different countries, uh, namely uh, NCPs that are not part of the network, of the Aetna 2020 network, possibly NCPs from third countries. And uh, the idea is to uh, share good knowledge and to give a sort of training to uh, NCPs which are less experienced that we can learn with each other. That was it. If you want to know more, please uh, go to the website and contact the email there or contact myself. And we'll be happy to help you be more, uh, have more success in the transport area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're really done with all the presentations or interventions. Um, I just want to add on that, and I have to uh, particularly uh, uh, thank uh, our NCP colleagues, and just to mention that. In addition to our Info Day today, which is the main one in Brussels, held in the premises of the program office, we will also have uh, two more national Info Day where the program office is participating, and that is coming soon next week in France, and I think in, uh, in February in uh, Spain. So that's where we, we are going to be there also, and uh, it's together with our colleagues, the NCP colleagues in the, in the member states. And uh, to tell you that if you also, by the time of the deadline, of course, consider organizing a, a national info day specifically for our call, or if you do it more generally and our call should be included, uh, we can also offer participation uh, that we can help you on the spot to, to do that in your country. Um, I also want to mention and to thank again the people who were online. We have more that we had. I think we still have them there. More than 60 participants uh, online, so at least the same number like we have in the room, I believe. And two more issues that I think they are new and uh, we didn't mention to you in the proposal, but I would like myself at least, I noticed them, uh, with the new calls of the Commission. So for the access pages, just be careful that as of this year, they are not watermarked access pages, they are just uh, empty. So the experts, if you uh, have an access page after the 65 pages, for example, for the Part B of Proposal, the page 66, it disappears. So even if you submit more than 65, the experts in the past were uh, recommended to disregard, but at least they could see it and it was up to them to read it. Now they are out, so the pages are blank as of this year. And the second point, please do not introduce, in order to have more information than the 65 pages, you might introduce hyperlinks. In the proposal, they will be instructed not to read anything in addition to the 65 plus five pages. 
Okay, so please do not do, do that, hoping and or maybe later saying, oh, but I provided the information. No, if it's not in the 65 plus 5 pages, neither on the hyperlinks nor in the access pages will not be given to the experts. So this I wanted still to mention because I think we have not mentioned enough. Okay, I think, I believe, I checked. Uh, we do not have any questions received online. We still have time for questions for about 20 minutes. So if you have questions from the room, I will start by there. I think I gave you the privilege for the previous session to start first. I will come back to you. Please. Hello, everyone. Ali Turkeli from Eurohub Consultancy. I'm here on behalf of Istanbul Technical University from uh, Istanbul, obviously. Um, regarding the 65 plus 5, pages, uh, what we, uh, the biggest problem for us when writing drafting proposals and for the university as well, is handling the references, especially with regards to fuel cells and hydrogen where um, it's, let's say it's extensive scientific proposals, too many um, references, too many citations, which cover a lot of space. Um, how would you recommend we deal with those now that they can't see anything? Because Previously, I have to be honest, we would bet on putting them uh, in the, at, in the, and the end and they will just see it because they're not going to read it anyway, but they can see the references. Now, what do we do? Basic. That's the question. Uh, well, I, I, I have many tips to recommend, uh, but uh, I, I don't know how my experts will react. That I cannot guarantee. So I, I can only say that in addition to the 65 plus 5, you also have the chapter 4 and 5 where you have no limits of pages, where you describe the consortium and for the ethics. Uh, there, if you can find place in there for references or citations or whatever, I would recommend you use that space in the chapters 4 or 5 to put references or citations. That might be the only recommendation that I can have right now. Again, I don't know how my experts will react because if you send their 100 pages, they might say, mm, no, read the 20 and that's it. So don't push too much, I would say. Yeah. It's quite the same question, but the specific is about Usually when we fill a project, we put some um, letter of not recommendation, but uh, letter of support. Mm -hmm. Will it be the same situation? They will be deleted? or Because, was, uh, of course, it wasn't uh, was optionally, but it was some like a good uh, an idea to, to show to us that our work is important for somebody. And now, let's understand, also this uh, uh, letter of support will be blank. Again, if it goes as of page 66, which you should not have done before also. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but again, that should be in the section four. I think it was very clear from the beginning that you should not write more than 65 pages. I think we, the commission didn't have a tool that could delete, so it was just watermarking not to be read. Now I think the tool is just deleting. So my recommendation, use the sections four and five where you have no limitation in terms of pages, but don't go too far with that. Huh? Jean-Paul Mossou, Tractabel, regarding the consortium, the international partners, I mean international outside of Europe, uh, two questions uh, regarding the evaluation rules, is the excellence, the impact, the implementations, what will be the uh, result of such international consortium on the quotation? First question. Uh, the second is regarding the grant. If one of our subsidiary company with legal entity in other country, India, Australia, for example, we have the name of our company. Uh, can we transfer part of the grant that you receive as European based company to them? I will. I can give the floor also to the to my legal officer, and I'm I'm talking under her supervision. Uh, but my answer to the first question, uh, you can understand that, uh, as, we, as we said, the participation is open to the world. So we encourage them to participate. 
The problems, if I can call them like that, come when we talk about funding of these organizations. So as long as they participate and they are beneficial to the project, the experts, of course, will welcome their participation. Of course, you will have to justify, and especially in the implementation criteria, why you needed international partners, why you didn't find the expertise in Europe, what is so crucial for the project when working with international partners. So that is where the experts will look in particular into the implementation criteria, and especially if you ask for funding, that is where they will give an opinion if they should be funded or not. And of course, if you have not managed to explain to them why they are crucial for the project, you might get penalized for that. Okay? So, and the badat will be under the implementation criterion. If they, the experts recommend them to be funded, that has to go to the governing board and they need to take a decision for exceptional funding to international partners. And I understand the problem with your affiliate, but that applies like for any other international partners. Am I right? Yes. That applies like for any international partner. And it's not because we are not open to the world, which we said we are. But with the EU taxpayers' money, we should create jobs in Europe, I believe. And I think this is what we have primarily to do. And this is mainly the philosophy behind. If you really cannot do your job in your company in Europe without the activities of your affiliate in India, for example, explain that to the experts, convince them so that they can recommend to our board to do this exceptional funding. Otherwise, it's not possible. Yeah, we can debate the whole day on that, please. Uh, it was a question not for that we need them, but I was understanding uh, from Barbie back in the beginning that it should be good if Europe can also push other countries in the world to develop the same technology that we want to develop here. And this in the context of my questions. Uh, not that we need them to make the project, but uh, we can together develop not only Europe, but also export already the knowledge that we will acquire here in Europe. Yes, and this is like, like uh, you mentioned, that was more a political desire. And I think we should be careful that it does not follow outside the rules of Horizon 2020. Huh? Like I said, you can have them and the government in India can pay them. Or if they are under the, the normal um, rules of Horizon 2020. We have U.S. partners, for example, and I think that's maybe more to the developed also country my, my director was referring. We can have U.S., Canadian, he mentioned Canada. We can have partners and we can have understanding with uh, the governments there that they can support the, the, the partners coming from those countries. So you have to, again, first of all, have that partner because it's crucial for the project not just because we take them into the project, but if we really want to develop to other markets, you have to explain to our experts why we do that. Again, one thing is the political desire, one thing is the project per se. Don't fall into that trap, please. Any other question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Van Herle from uh, EPFL in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. I have a question with respect to coordination and uh, subcontracting, the consortium composition. So um, there's more and more companies, um, consulting companies, uh, becoming specialized in um, setting up a project proposal and uh, doing the coordination, uh, the communication, uh, dissemination and so. I think this is a, a, a good uh, generally good experience and, and development because it discharges professors and researchers and SME CEOs uh, running the companies. So um, um, the question, the, there's two questions. So to have a, um, uh, a partner in the consortium that is typically taking care of this, uh, of this effort, is that seen as a generally a positive or is it not, is it neutral, not relevant? And then also, uh, must this partner be um, a, a, full, a full partner or can it be a subcontractor? So, there are several aspects. Uh, you, you mentioned coordination and you mentioned dissemination and communication. I think 
first of all, for dissemination and communication, I think uh, I, w I will address them differently. Hmm? Because the coordinator has to be the coordinator of the, of the program, and I will not recommend, and it's forbidden in the grant, that you subcontract any of the coordinator tasks. So clearly the coordinator is a member of the consortium, and all the coordinator tasks are to be done by the coordinator. There is a specific role for the coordinator, and there is specific budget for management, for managing the consortium. So that's one. As regards dissemination and exploitation, again, it depends on the activities. If there are partners in charge of a specific work package, normally communication dissemination should be a specific work package, and there are main partners doing that, again I would recommend, and this is my recommendation always, huh? I would recommend that there are partners in the project, look at their budget, and I will not subcontract these activities. Why? And again I'm, I'm talking, this is my personal point of view, the experts will all, always look at a subcontractor that you, you do not have full control of the subcontractor. And should, you should not subcontract big part of the tasks, main tasks of a project. And I believe dissemination and exploitation are main tasks. To hire or to have a subcontract with a PR company that takes what you develop as dissemination or communication and just multiplies, that's something else. The, a PR company could be a subcontractor, but still, Dissemination and communication you should do yourself in the project. You should have a partner in the project. And like I said, use different small subcontracts for different activities. But I will not recommend entire part of our entire work packages to be given to a subcontractor. Yeah? Any other question? Yes. Maria Reinert von uh, Steinbeis 2i from Germany. Uh, I have a question also about composition, composition of uh, um, the consortium. In former years and former projects, it was like, I think it was like that that there, was, there had to be a member of Hydrogen Europe or of Hydrogen uh, um, Europe uh, Energy uh, Research in the consortium. Is it still like that? Not for this call. There is no requirement for this call. Any other question? Any other question? No? Everybody's hungry. Good. I hope the caterers are ready for us because we are earlier 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, just to stay with me a minute. Uh, just to explain to you for the brokerage event uh, in the afternoon. So you have your uh, color thingy already, I hope. Uh, and you will be guided to the different uh, rooms because there will be uh, five different uh, parallel brokerage sessions. And the transport research is going to be on the fifth floor. You probably have received this, uh, this uh, paper, so look at it. So fifth floor, room 32, and you will be there together with my colleague Pietro, the one who presented first this morning. Uh, the next one, and that is the green. The next one is the red, and that looks at transport innovation and uh, deployment, and uh, you stay here. And that's including overarching, and that would be Enrique and Lionel. Um, energy, hydrogen production and storage, uh, you also stay here because we will split the r these rooms. Here we are uh, in, I think, three rooms, three different rooms, meeting rooms, which we made one and we will split in three. You also stay here, so the orange, uh, and that will be the room number two. The same uh, for the other part of energy, stationary, and uh, in the first one for, for production and storage, you will be with Nikos, the second one, Antonio and Dionysis. And the last one, uh, the blue, will be the cross-cutting, and will be on the fourth floor, where, where our offices are. Uh, if you have a presentation, a few slides, please go there before the meeting starts, at least 10 minutes before, that we make sure that you have uploaded your presentation. You can appreciate that we need to do that in order for the, for the brokerage event to go smooth. And my last uh, kind request to you is please, when you walk on the corridors, please do not uh, be too noisy. 
because especially for those going on the fourth and fifth floor, because there are offices at those floors. I mean, here for the, on the first floor, we only have meeting rooms. But fourth and fifth floor, my kind uh, request to you is please uh, respect the, the privacy of the offices and uh, please do not be too noisy. <laughs> So with that, I thank you very much. And I, according to this distribution, please go to this room or follow uh, the colleagues who are going to moderate, like I mentioned them. And I wish you fruitful uh, discussions in the afternoon back at 2.30. Thank you. And, and a second, when you will go to the lunch, which is served at the reception, close, take, take all your belongings because we are going to reconstruct the meeting rooms. The clothes hanger will be put on the lobby. Thank you.